Hi everyone, you've probably heard about quantum computing, but what's beneath the buzzword? What transformative capabilities could quantum computers unleash? Is it possible that they could accelerate the development of AI? Or conversely, could AI be the catalyst for quantum computing breakthroughs? Keep watching to find out more. This video has three parts. What is a quantum computer? What can you use a quantum computer for? And can a quantum computer be used to make more effective AI? Part one, what is a quantum computer? When we say the word computer today, we're actually referring to digital computers based on microprocessors. It's hard to imagine imagine any other type of computer, but a long time ago, we used to have analog computers based on completely different principles. For example, the very first computer was the Moniac, which was actually an analog computer. It used hydraulics to model the flow of money in an economy. It modeled the entire British economy and allowed them to predict the effects at a macroeconomic scale of any monetary policy changes they might make. An analog system basically just uses floating point numbers or real numbers. The Moniac, for example, would have used water pressure to represent amount of money. This works to a degree and it's great for differential equations, but when you move to a digital system where everything is represented with ones and zeros, you can be a lot more precise in your calculations. Current digital processors have advanced significantly throughout the years following Moore's law, basically getting twice as powerful every 18 months. And that's led to an immense amount of miniaturization. Current digital processors use about six electrons to represent a one within a transistor. That's how small they are. When a computer uses memory like RAM, the contents of the memory cells have to be constantly refreshed because of quantum effects where the electrons might escape slowly. A lot of computer hardware is having to work around quantum effects like hard drives are having to do that. And SSDs are actually based around leveraging quantum effects to work properly. They actually use an electrical charge to force an electron to undergo quantum tunneling to get put into the memory cell. So given this crazy level of technology that we've already achieved, what exactly can a quantum computer add? Well, a quantum computer actually ends up using the universe itself as a substrate for computation. That's a bit of a mouthful, so let's break it down. Instead of using binary states 0 and 1 for computation, quantum computer computers try to represent both 0 and 1 at the same time. We'll see in a minute why having both 0 and 1 at the same time can be beneficial. There are actually lots of physical ways to build a quantum computer. As soon as you start getting small enough, you start seeing quantum effects on all kinds of different particles and situations. For example, there have been prototype quantum computers based on the spin of electrons or the properties of photons. I believe the current technology that's generally used is to create superconducting circuits, which have to be kept at near absolute 0 to function properly. The big thing to know about quantum computers is that the universe doesn't really like being used as a computer. In other words, whenever you're trying to put something into a superposition where it's both zero and one, it can collapse at any time because you could observe it or something else could happen like a collision with another particle that causes it to collapse into a known state. So quantum computers have to constantly fight this. They have to try to keep their values in this superposition of states, which means minimizing interference. So again, that's why going down to absolute zero is one of the best things you can do because then particles aren't really moving around and, and causing interruptions in your computations. So far, I haven't used too much terminology, I hope, but I'll introduce a bit here. Digital computers use zeros and ones, and that's called a bit or a binary digit. And so when quantum computers use a zero to one range, they call it a qubit or quantum bit. The name for when these qubits collapse into state zero or state one is called quantum decoherence or just collapse. And so generally, when you're thinking about quantum computations, you have to be able to run the same computation multiple times until you get lucky and the qubits don't collapse. Or you can also use multiple physical qubits to represent one logical qubit, and you can basically use them as error correcting codes so that you just bet on the fact that at least one of these qubits didn't collapse. So this all sounds very exotic and quantum computers seem like something from science fiction, but actually there are already places you can go online to cloud providers and just rent quantum computers for use. They're quantum computers with not very many qubits. They're not very powerful, but they already exist and they're accessible for not too much money. Part two, what can you use a quantum computer for? With analog computers and binary computers, you're basically basically creating small mechanical or electrical, I guess, building blocks that when put together in the thousands or millions or more, perform a mechanical operation for you or perform an electrical operation for you in a way that makes sense. But when you're trying to make a quantum computer, you're not trying to build small building blocks, you're just trying to use the basic building blocks that physics provide, small particles in other words, and use those as the foundation for your computer. Of course, you also generally have to put a lot of protection around those small particles because particles left to their own devices are just going to disappear into the ether. If you have a friend that likes to study theoretical computer science, you might have heard of Turing machines, which are basically a theoretical construct that represents any possible computation. Anyway, the controller part of the Turing machine is basically a graph where you can transition between different states to keep track of whatever step of the computation you're on. A regular computer is always at one place in that graph. A quantum computer can be in many places at once because of this property of qubits of being between a zero and a one. Quantum computer is basically non-deterministically in as many states as you would like, potentially all of them. This is an interesting 
interesting model because a Turing machine is supposed to represent anything that you can compute, anything that modern computers do, anything that you could reasonably describe as doing in a series of step-by-step -step instructions, a Turing machine can represent that same operation. What this means is that a quantum computer is not allowing you to compute anything new. You're still implementing a Turing machine. You're just implementing the brain of the Turing machine in a potentially much more efficient way. So a quantum computer can't be used to solve anything that can't, in theory, be solved already. However, big but. If you have a very complicated search problem, the classical computer has to explore every single option one by one. Now, we have very fast classical computers, but the search space of a problem can grow extremely quickly. For example, if you have a bunch of genes, each of which can be expressed or not expressed, in other words, zero or one, and you have 10 genes, okay, so now you have two to the 10 different options. If you add an 11th gene, now you have two to the 11 different options. It's growing exponentially. Every gene you add is going to double the amount of possible options. Once you get to a couple hundred genes, you're well beyond the computational capabilities of modern computers. However, with a quantum computer, you're not having to explore every step of the way one at a time. In theory, you can just take the quantum algorithm, put all the data in once, and run the algorithm through one iteration, and out pops the answer. You're basically exploring all the possible paths in one go. And there's actually a very interesting and physical interpretation of this. If you imagine you're doing a search problem and there's only one correct path, one right path, every other path leads to a dead end. What you do with a quantum computer is you put in a bunch of qubits that no one has observed yet, so you're exploring all the paths, and then at the other end, you measure only the valid path, and suddenly that measurement collapses down to this single path that actually works. And that means that the act of you measuring it somehow affected the past states of these qubits so that they were actually zeros and ones all along. They were actually representing the correct answer all along. A little bit like time travel. And this is why Einstein said, quantum physics can't possibly be real. I think the quote was more like, God doesn't play dice with the universe. Finally, I will note that there are a lot of caveats with that story, right? You might have noticed that I said, run the quantum algorithm. So first of all, a quantum algorithm has to exist. There isn't a quantum analog for every algorithm that can run on a classical computer. It can take some time to develop those algorithms. And a quantum computer will still have some digital components in it to set up the initial experiment and let it run. So what problems can you solve with a quantum computer? Or rather, which problems can you solve efficiently? Because we know that you can solve the exact same problems as you could with a regular computer. Everything is just a Turing machine. But there are some cases where you can search and magically pick out the right path at the first try. Basically, there's this unresolved problem in computer science, which you might have heard of, trying to figure out whether p equals np. And basically, p are very easy to solve problems, and np are really hard to solve problems. And most interesting problems end up being np problems, or np complete problems, as they're called. And these np complete problems are the ones that quantum computers might be very good at. Again, you still have to find an algorithm for it, but they're the ones that are really slow for regular computers, and so therefore quantum computers would have a leg up. So you can do a lot with NP complete algorithms. Like I said, most interesting problems end up being NP complete. I'll just give some examples flight scheduling, or the layout of a CPU, or figuring out nanotechnology and manufacturing optimization, or doing drug research, or scientific research, of course, in physics and other areas. These examples are all ones in which quantum computers would probably do really well, and I tried to pick problems where it's quite likely that we will develop or already have developed quantum algorithms. I mentioned that existing quantum computers are not very powerful. They don't have very many qubits. In other words, they can't tackle large problems. There are some existing quantum computers that are hard-coded for specific algorithms, usually quantum annealing. That's what the D-Wave computer does. So again, if you happen to have a problem that can be solved with quantum annealing, then you might be in luck. My personal belief is that biotechnology and probably nanotechnology are going to be the biggest benefactors of having quantum computing available. When you can simulate physics really well, you can simulate protein folding really well, you can figure out the exact configuration of molecules that should be used to create the equivalent of DNA that can create other stuff. In other words, when you're actually interacting with the physical universe, then using a quantum computer, which literally is running in the physical universe, is extremely helpful. Part three, can a quantum computer make more effective AI? It's an interesting question. What does AI need? Well, today, AI is pr primarily in the form of neural networks. LLMs, or large language models, are also implemented as neural networks, which means you need to have emulation of neurons and synapses, the connections between neurons, so that you can have these layers of neurons, one after the other, that form deep neural networks. What's interesting is that precise computation within each of these neurons is not actually required. In fact, for performance, a lot of machine learning uses half precision floating point numbers, which are not very precise, but they do the job. For these types of requirements, GPUs are already almost the ideal computing mechanism. Neural networks are benefiting from two properties of our modern computers. First, each computation is fast and reliable. Qubits are not really reliable. You have to use multiple qubits in order to get the job done. And the second property is that you can have a huge number of computations. Basically, even though you're looking at a problem one step at a time, you can do that extremely quickly and you can be looking at 
a hundred or a million problems at once. And each step of the way is going to be precise enough and reliable enough that you will get the result you need. Of course, GPUs or technology like GPUs can and will continue to improve. It's not like we're maxed out there, but the structure and the design of that computing mechanism is pretty ideal. We know that quantum computers are better for certain types of problems and that algorithms have to be redesigned to run on quantum computers. So the brain of an AI, like a neural network, wouldn't directly benefit. However, an AI could use a quantum computer as a type of module that it can call out to and ask to solve a certain problem. It's highly likely that AI in the future is going to be built this way anyway, call out to different modules to do different types of reasoning, spatial reasoning, temporal reasoning, memory, etc. And with the AI's reasoning, along with this very powerful way of solving NP-complete problems, it's hard to say exactly what would fall out, but I think you would see solutions and things that seem almost physically impossible, but were computed at just the right level of detail to actually make feasible. And there are two very important things that you could do with a quantum computer, or especially with an AI hooked up to a quantum computer. And the first is you could determine more efficient processor layouts and computer design, while the second is that you could determine more efficient manufacturing processes, probably even nanotechnology and nanofactories and so on. And the reason these two are very important is it means that an AI hooked up to a quantum computer would quickly be able to create better computer hardware on which to run even just the classical portion of the AI. I think that would be very close to the singularity because it would allow the AI to start creating better AI. Finally, there's an interesting question of when. When will quantum computers become available? And you can measure that against when you think more powerful AI will become available. There's an interesting term, quantum advantage, which refers to the point where it becomes cheaper to actually solve certain problems on a quantum computer compared to a classical computer. And we're only a few years away from that. Some examples are Ion Q trying to deliver a 1024 qubit machine by 2028. Google saying they'll create a 1 million physical qubit machine by 2029. Although because of requirements that you have to use multiple qubits to actually reduce the errors that are going to happen due to quantum decoherence, that might only be like a thousand logical qubits or depending on how good their error correcting schemes are. And finally, IBM saying that they want to have 100,000 qubits by 2033 within 10 years. And I assume that's logical qubits. These numbers may not sound too large, but remember that they basically represent the exponent of a problem's search space. In other words, 100,000 qubits lets you explore two to the power of 100,000 different states at once. Even a 300 qubit computer can explore more states than there are atoms in the universe at the same time. And by the way, the largest available quantum computer today has 433 qubits. So taking all that together, I think it's safe to say you would have quantum advantage within five, 10 years. And it sounds like you might have quite a few qubits within five to eight years as well. Again, I actually think that advanced AI is probably on a faster timeline than that. So maybe we will actually use AI to help accelerate this quantum computing timeline. And then eventually AI can use those quantum computers to kickstart the singularity. Finally, in conclusion, quantum computers use qubits, which are a zero and a one at the same time in a state of superposition. As soon as you look at the qubit, it decoheres and becomes either a zero or a one. And quantum algorithms are trying to push that collapse into the future as much as possible because the power from a quantum computer comes when it's in both of those states at once. Quantum computers can't solve anything that a regular computer couldn't solve if given infinite time, but they're much faster at solving a lot of NP-complete problems, which are the ones that we actually care about when we're trying to do difficult things like figure out climate change, do protein folding, create nanofactories, etc. Quantum computers exist today. You can go and rent them from the cloud. And the biggest quantum computer that has been built so far by IBM has 433 qubits. We might be about five years away from quantum advantage or from the number of qubits getting large enough that it's actually much more useful to have a quantum computer than a classical computer for certain problems. But we're building AI at the same time and we might have AI that's quite powerful long before that. And that means that AI either operated in tandem with a human or running entirely on its own, like AGI, might actually allow us to improve those quantum computer designs and reach those milestones sooner. And once you have an AI that can access a quantum computer, that's when things get really interesting in terms of nanotechnology and other advances in terms of how well we can control the physical world, because that is the real power of a quantum computer is to set a problem into the physical world, encoding it into electrons or whatever, and allowing the universe to pick the correct path through the maze. If you enjoyed this video and you think that quantum computers are just around the corner, check out this previous video I made on why advanced AI or AGI might arrive even sooner than quantum computers. All right, that's all I have for today. Thank you very much for watching. Bye.